Welcome to the Plant Centered and Thriving Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Kitchens. Welcome to part two, best of 2021. I am thrilled to bring you inspirational stories from former clients and everyday people, people that I've had the privilege of interviewing this past year. And I just, I pulled pieces of information and pieces of their story that I hope will inspire you going into 2022. So here we go. Best of 2021 part two. Let's get started. My first guest today is Jack. I have known him for many, many years. We met originally on social media and we've been able to meet up in person, which is really, really neat. Uh, I just love how social media brings people together. Jack is so generous in his vulnerability as we discuss both his success and his struggles that he's faced while on his plant-based journey. Here's Jack. With this plant-based journey, you know, and being on it for several years now, what kind of, you know, maybe successes have you found or what do you feel like has changed in your life? Yeah. So one, I mean, obviously weight loss. I started at 514 pounds and I'm down to, I was 294 this morning. So, I mean, I've almost lost 220 pounds Yeah. naturally. I mean, it takes time. So I didn't rush it. I'm trying to do it the right way. Uh, I don't take any medicine anymore. So no yeah. cholesterol, no blood pressure medicine, no pre-diabetes medicine. A lot of my blood levels are normalized. Uh, I go for my annual physical this year and I'll see where I'm at. Uh, there are some things that run in my family. So I'm just trying to combat that through, through eating healthy exercise, because while it may be genetic, I think that you can beat a lot of things mm-hmm. just by proper nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the exercise piece too. And I know that you highlight this as well on social media, but you also run and are fairly active as well. Like that's a big part of your lifestyle, not just the plant-based eating, but activity is a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, six to seven days a week doing something, either walking, jogging. I fell in love with cycling. Uh, I started weight training with a a trainer. Um, just, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I talked about this with someone else and I said, I'm not an athlete. And he was like, dude, you're an athlete. He's like, you, you are active almost every day in the week consistently. Yeah. Yes. And I was like, well, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> and two, how do you feel, you know, because you you're exercising, you know, consistently, how do, how do you feel like your body feels with doing that more often? It feels stronger. I mean, I have my aches and pains. Everybody does. And I attribute some of that to the abuse that I put my body through my entire life of being overweight and carrying around the extra weight and not caring for it. So I try not to get too down when I have a sore knee consistently or some, you know, I had surgery on my knee in college, but I'm trying to do as much as possible to take that strain and pressure off of my body and strengthen it. But the amount of energy that I have, the things that I'm capable of doing that I would have never, ever dreamed of is, is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Back when you were 30, 31 years old, could you envision where you are now? <laughs> no, no yes. way. Like, I had no idea I would be going out on a Saturday for a 20 mile bike ride on the trail. Like, right? Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. And I love highlighting the successes. And I think kind of with this too, it's also important to highlight, which Jack, this is something I really appreciate about you is you're very vulnerable and transparent with your journey that it's not just all wins. There are some, some valleys that you walk through. There are some struggles. So anything now that you feel like maybe you're still kind of coming up against, or even anything that you came up in the beginning that you want to tell the listener. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm very, transparent it's not linear by any means I have struggles you know last year with COVID and everything I picked up some pounds you know and I I got on it toward the end of the year and was able to get back to a manageable point and then pick it back up this year and keep going uh last year I think it was one of my cholesterol numbers started to creep up and I fought myself because I was eating a lot of processed stuff you know I wasn't eating as much fruit veggies legumes beans all the good stuff you know I was eating more Here's some processed sausage and, and while well, that stuff's fine in moderation, you can't eat that six days a week for weeks and expect it to really impact you the way you want. So, yep. you know, I struggle, I fall off the wagon. I always tell myself the biggest thing that I did this time that I didn't do in my entire life is I said, let me see what happens if I don't give up and if I keep going. Yeah. So I remember that and I pick it back up and I get going. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And part of it is like you, this sort of unwavering belief in yourself and this person that you're continuing to become. 
Mary was also a former client of mine, and we discuss how she learned to protect herself from diet culture, especially around friends and family after dieting for nearly 30 years. And Mary was also started on Weight Watchers as an elementary school child. And I just, I love her vulnerability as well. So here's Mary. How do you feel like, and for someone listening who kind of is also in that situation is maybe goes to an event or is with family and there's a lot of maybe that diet culture talk or dieting talk. What's maybe one thing that you feel like that you do well, or that you're trying to do to sort of maybe protect yourself. And what do you feel like is helpful for you in particular? Well, I think it's, it also varies by the day. And, and a lot of our journey has been extending myself grace and really unpacking why I think things are why I do things. And so, you know, some days I do just keep quiet. Other days I bring food that I would eat. Sometimes I do eat what's offered. Like it's, it's just, it varies so much, but the point I think is that I'm trying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things like we had my aunt's funeral and we were looking through pictures of everyone, you know, everybody brings out the big crates and, you know, it's a good time Mm -hmm. looking at the pictures. And it was just so sad because two of my sisters were like taking the pictures of themselves and running away with them and ripping them up. Or they were saying, oh my gosh, I was so ugly. Or all of these horrible negative comments about themselves. And I just stood up and I said, look, I said, what you're telling yourself, your daughters are gonna tell themselves. I said, do you want your daughters to feel the way that you feel right now looking at these pictures? I said, you haven't said a single positive thing about you. I said, I looked at that picture and I thought, wow, she looked beautiful in her prom dress. I didn't think your hair looked ugly. I didn't think you looked fat. None of those thoughts occurred to me. I said, but what you're, you are speaking out loud, these horrible things about yourself and your daughter is standing right here next to you. Yeah. I was like, and it has to stop. I was like, I'm not going to stand in this room and, and, and look at pictures anymore with you if you don't stop. Now I can Mm -hmm. say that because that's family. Sure. (laughs) But you know, like, so it is, it it does depend on, on the situation. You know, I I think also how much have I poured into myself that day? You know, if I'm choosing foods that make me feel the best, if I'm sleeping, if I'm going for my walks with Banshee, if I'm taking my quiet hour and reading, if I'm doing those things, then I have a better ability to stand strongly in doing what feels best for me. Yeah. And when those st- things start falling by the wayside, cause I get too busy for my quiet hour, or, you know, I didn't meal prep and I'm just grabbing whatever's in the fridge because I'm starving and hangry Mary is not a pleasant, <laughs> not a pleasant person. <laughs> you know, if I, if the, when I stop putting myself first, And I stop doing the things that I need to do to feel my best. I am not as strong standing up for the way I want to live my life because then that narrative starts in, oh, well, you're a hypocrite. You're not perfect. You're not doing what you're preaching, you know? And so, you know, you you really can't stand up to the world if you're not pouring into yourself and what you need to do every day. Yeah. Amen to that. And it's not selfish. And that's a really hard thing, you know, like as a Christian, I really want to serve others, you know, and, and, and be kind and those kinds of things. And so it can be hard. And even as mothers, regardless of your religious background, you, you are putting other people before you constantly day in and day out. And, you know, it can feel selfish at first, you know, to take care of you. Yeah. Um, but I, I would think my children would rather have me around longer, mm-hmm. you know, my book, my biological mom and my adopted mom both died very young from cancer. And I, I think I would rather have them taking care of themselves Yeah, and possibly had a longer time with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Amanda, who is also a former client of mine, we discuss the Weight Watchers, also known as WW, the point system there, and how that disrupted her own body's cues. Here's Amanda. So talking about the point system, I'm curious, you know, you talked about saving up your points or maybe going over 30 points and being like, whoa, you know, what do I do now? So how did, how do you feel like maybe using that point system almost like disrupted like your body's ability or your ability to read your body's cues of hunger and fullness, which is something that we talked a lot about with our time together. 
A thousand percent, yes. Something that the community of Weight Watchers encourages you to do is kind of game the system, like bulk up your meals with zero point foods, which is commonly like fruits and vegetables, I guess. And so it'll be like, okay, if you're having like a stir fry with some tofu over rice, like, you know, those things are going to be points. And if you want to have like more rice or more tofu or whatever, you have to like bulk up your meal with veggies and like lots of broccoli. And so I like really took that to heart. And so I would have these like plates that were just like overflowing with stir fry. And I'd be like, well, I tracked seven points for this. I have to eat every bite because if I leave something on my plate, like mentally, I can't figure that out. Like I tracked seven points, but what did I leave? Like two thirds of it, one third, like how many points do I reduce? Or am I not doing myself like a, a service of getting all the points I am owed today? Um, and very much there would be days where like, maybe it was like a more fruit and veggie heavy day for whatever reason. And I'd get to the end of the night and I'd be like, well, I still have seven points left. I guess I have to eat some chips and hummus, or I guess I have to eat some ice cream or whatever, you know. And uh, whether I was hungry or not, or whether those were the foods that I really needed. So it did disrupt it a little bit. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, because in a way you're relying on these external cues to tell you what to eat, how much to eat, how much you should or shouldn't eat instead of like your own body. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I have spent a lot of time on that. And especially around even just like the components of a meal. Uh, you know, some meals are more veggie heavy than others. And I have this like, back of my mind, like nagging voice always. That's like, you gotta bulk it up with zero point foods. Oh, are you hungry? Have an apple. Don't have any peanut butter with it because that's too many points. Like, so I have kind of quieted that, that voice a little bit, but there are definitely times where I'm like, oh, I know what that is. I know where that's coming from. Yes, which is good. I'm glad that you're aware of it. That's like the first step, right? Is like being aware of yeah. like where this voice is coming from. Be like, okay, no, that voice needs to go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So a lot of sort of, like you said, unlearning and relearning some things, even just something like, you know, your hunger and fullness cues and things like that. Yes. Well, it's so much of what the community kind of encourages is like that. And I think it's all diets, right? It's like, oh, be really like strict, be really good, like Monday through Thursday or Friday. And then like Saturday's your cheat day or in Weight Watchers, you get um, a bank of like kind of extra points that you can use on top of your daily allowance. Some people just like eat a little bit more every day. Some people save them for like a Thanksgiving meal, for example, or on like Saturday, I'm going to go out for drinks with the girls. And then I have all these extra points for wine, but very much it's like, oh, it's Saturday, like time to eat a heartier breakfast, time to get that takeout, time to have that ice cream. And it encourages this kind of like peak of like overeating or like overindulging or like the gal who wanted a donut like she was encouraged to like wait till Saturday and if you still really wanted it to go get a donut you know and so about a year ago I remember realizing after spending some time with you that I was honoring those needs like throughout the week like maybe on Tuesday I had ice cream and maybe on Thursday we ordered takeout but it was just like even like it evened out and then maybe after having ice cream on Tuesday like Wednesday I didn't have ice cream and then like Friday I had like a lighter lunch because I was still full from takeout on Thursday or you know whatever and it really balanced out and it created this sense of like food freedom yes perfect use of that word those words I know. <laughs> yeah and almost like this this natural flow and too like the trust that you had with yourself to recognize that oh hey like I can have ice cream on a Tuesday and maybe I don't even want it on a Wednesday or do takeout on Thursday and have a lighter lunch. like that is sort of the ebb and flow of just life in general because we're not robots we don't eat the exact same amount every single day or the exact same points every single day that changes Becky, who is also my mother, we discuss tips and tricks for navigating her transition while in a small town in Indiana where plant-based is far, far, far from the norm. And trust me, I've lived there. I'm actually here right now and it is very much far from the norm. So here's Becky. And I'm curious, what was helpful for you, for people who are listening and maybe they have children who are going plant-based or they themselves are trying to go plant-based and, you know, navigating these like family experiences. What do you think was helpful for you with your two daughters going plant-based and growing up in the Midwest and kind of this being a very unfamiliar way of eating? What was helpful for you to kind of approach that situation? Well, 
for one thing, you know, your dad being on board. So, you know, we were both able to do it together and you guys fixed some pretty good meals. I mean, they were delicious. I don't, I guess I don't know how much, how else to say it is that you made it very easy transitioning for us. And, 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 and dad and I are pretty, oh, you know, we're easy to get along with. So to us, it's no big deal. I mean, I, neither one of us were like, we have to have our meat and potatoes every day. I know there are people that are like that. And I don't know how others deal with that, but it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's a great point too, for people who are transitioning or trying to kind of navigate their own journey and maybe eating with other people. What is, it sounds like was really helpful for you all was for those people who are transitioning. It's like to bring over really delicious meals and, and help kind of make the food or maybe guide you. Right. Yeah. And I, and I know between you and your sister, I mean, there were a lot of phone calls, texts, mom, just substitute. I mean, I know when we first got started, I know you had mentioned this earlier, but I had gone to four different grocery stores in one afternoon looking for one ingredient. And that was not fun. I mean, and it's like, really, my little small town, we don't have, you know, I mean, four grocery stores is great, but they just don't offer sometimes that. So, you know, that's when you make your trips to, you know, the grocery that's an hour away, that's maybe like Whole Foods or, you know, just different grocery stores. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and then you guys are really good at too. Well, mom, just substitute this. You don't need to put that in there. You, you can just, what about using this? Or even the other day, um, someone on your um, blog or what was talking about canned beans and it's like, oh yeah, I've got black beans in the cupboard. Mom, you don't have to make those. Just get yep. a can out, rinse them real good, throw them in. Yes. 100%. Right? Yeah. And that's a great tip for people who are in the Midwest or are in just a smaller town in general, where there's not a whole lot of variety when it comes to grocery stores or even like the right. ingredients they provide is right. really try and hack the system or hack the recipe in a way of like find ways to not have to go to every single grocery store or drive an hour. Or two. I know some people drive two, three hours to a more like whole food, like grocery store. Catherine, who is also my sister and she's now plant-based. Yay. She discusses tips about handling plant-based kids in the real world without restriction and by giving them autonomy. Here's what Catherine has to say. So you highlighted the fact that, you know, the kids sort of have the option to choose what it is that they want to eat. So whether it's like, like, like you said, maybe like a cupcake at school, or they want to choose the sugar snap peas or the carrots. How, how do you kind of go about doing that? Like sort of giving them the autonomy or giving them the choice and not restricting sure. or telling them what they should or shouldn't do. Yeah, I mean, so kids, they're obviously very smart, but they're um, obviously young as well. So sometimes they just don't understand, you know, they're not doing that critical thinking in their head. And so I think one thing I try to do is tell them up front, you know, absolutely you can have that, but I do want you to know that we've had maybe this and this today. So do you want to have that? Because that may, that extra sugar might be bad on your belly or something like that. So then it kind of gets their wheels turning to think for themselves like, okay, have I had enough sugar or have I had enough of this or whatever? And a lot of times they'll be like, no, okay, yeah, I'll have something else. You know, obviously sometimes they'll pick that sugary thing or whatever, but it's starting just getting those habits of, okay, you know, I'm starting to eat this. Let me think about what I've had today or what I've had in the last, whatever, um, however much exercise or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is just thinking of those things, trying to weigh all your options. Yeah. Just because it's there, you're kind of giving them that platform to take the time to reflect on what they've had, take the time to maybe get in touch, like you said, with them. And like, is this going to make my belly feel good? Or, you know, maybe yeah. do I actually want, you know, the carrots or the banana or whatever else it is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And quick, just quickly too, how do you manage them? Yeah. Going to like birthday parties. And I know that oh. they're always, you know, hanging out with friends and going to different events. So how do you also manage that too? Cause obviously everything isn't vegan, you know, when you're letting them go off right. to someone, someone else's house. Yeah. I mean, luckily sometimes they'll have like, people will have veggie trays and stuff like that. So we can, you know, get into those. The girls obviously would like to have a piece of cake or a cupcake or something like that. So they, they will usually do that. But one thing we also do is bring our own food a lot of places. 
a lot of times I just pack like a little cooler that has, you know, maybe, I don't know, some chopped fruit or some cereal or, you know, a granola bar or something like that. So if the kids do get hungry and they're like, Ooh, there's nothing like I want, you know, maybe there's a lot of meat in some things, you know, and they're like, mom, there's meat, which they've <laughs> done before. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, they can just get into my bag and see what I have. And then that also helps on cost too. If like, you know, we're out uh, doing grocery shopping or things, you know, a lot of times I know people will go get Starbucks or go get something to eat, you know, somewhere, but it's really nice having that bag of food. So I can just say, oh, here's a snack, you know, and that was, you know, free or whatever, because we didn't have to spend that extra money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of going above and beyond and taking that extra step to do a little bit of prepping before you go to a party or somebody's house, or even are running groceries for a couple hours. Cause like we talked about earlier, Catherine, when she goes to the grocery store, it's not just like 10 minutes out and back. Like it's, (laughs) it's, it's a haul. It's like half of the day. Yes. The kids are always asking, can I have a snack? (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think that's great too. And, and too, it goes back to that like you don't restrict what they eat. Uh, and especially when they do go to a friend's house or when you all go out, you know, they, they have that choice, but it sounds like more often yeah. than not, they're coming to you to see what you have in your snack bag or yeah. kind of choosing uh-huh. things that align with what makes them feel good too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm, beautiful. Capri has a very unique story to tell. And when I found out about it, I wanted her to come onto my podcast and share it with you. Capri recaps her nine year battle of undiagnosed endometriosis. She stumbles upon a Facebook group, which recommended a plant-based cookbook that finally provided some long overdue relief from her pain. Here's Capri. Before that, my husband had brought up going plant-based and I, and that was in 2018, we went plant-based we went zero. We went like standard American diet, boom, overnight, like plant-based, no gluten, no oil, like, you know, which was really hard to keep up with. Like, and, um, I felt like all I was doing was chopping vegetables and making food and then cleaning up and then eating it and then starting again. Like, And, uh, so we lasted on that for about six weeks and Mm. it was just too much. So, um, we started eating, then we just went back to normal, but I noticed after we went back to normal that my body, when we were eating plant-based did not hurt as much and my cycles were not as bad. And I was like, huh, I just noticed I haven't been in like level eight pain for the last few weeks, it's been at like a three, which was a significant improvement. So then we like stayed semi-plant-based after that, but not full on. But when I got colitis, then I went back to it fully because I was so scared to eat anything because wow. everything hurt so bad. Then in March of 2020, actually the day that we started uh, quarantining, I got appendicitis. Oh my like, gosh. Yes. So I ended up driving myself to the emergency room because they weren't going to allow people in the hospitals. So I drove myself to the emergency room, had an emergency appendectomy. And while they were in there, they said, we saw this cyst on her ovary. They told my husband this over the phone. Um, So after COVID, she should get that checked out. Like, don't do it now because of COVID. And so we were like, okay. Well, after that, my, my pain level was getting severe to the point where about 15 days a month, I could hardly get out of bed. And, um, and I have a high pain tolerance. Like I tore all of my ligaments in my ankle in high school and I walked on it for three months before I went. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So like, I mean, I have a high pain tolerance and this was pain where I was, I almost passed out. I was vomiting. Um, I like, I mean, I was just living in bed and, you know, the, we've always homeschooled. And so the boys would just bring their school and they would do it next to me in bed and I would help them through it. And we would read books. And my husband was like, we can't, we can't continue like this. This is. And so I pushed and went to the doctor, my regular gynecologist. She did an ultrasound and said, it looks like you have an endometrioma. The cyst looks like an endometrioma. And I was like, okay, but she didn't tell me what that was. And so I went home and researched it. And I was like, that's endometriosis. 
that's what I said like nine years ago that I thought was the problem. And so my research showed if you've got an endometrioma, then you're in late stage endometriosis. It's like it's infiltrating your organs at that point. But she still didn't want to do anything. She just said, well, just take birth control and the mm. birth control will help it. And I was like, there's got to be something more. Like, yeah. There has to be something more going on. So I started researching and I actually found an author, she's a cookbook author who's plant-based and uses plant-based eating to help control her endometriosis symptoms. Oh. And she, and so I got her book like right away and yeah. started reading about her story. And I was like, oh my goodness, like everything started falling in place. Like the times that I didn't have as much pain was when I was like really focused on my diet and nutrition and keeping it clean and keeping it plant focused. And so it's like, well, until I can get some answers, I guess that that's what I'll, I'll do, you know, to try to manage my symptoms without these medications. And so that's what I focused on until I was able to get into a doctor who specializes in endometriosis. He teaches this specific type of surgery to other surgeons and trains them on it. I was able to get seen by him. He happened to have a cancellation in his schedule. So like I called and got an appointment right away. And then they happened to have another surgery cancellation two oh. weeks from that. And so it was like, we got all the tests done really quick. Cause you have to have biopsies, check for cancer, check for all that, you know, and my endometriosis was so severe that I actually had to have a complete hysterectomy because it had been left untreated for so mm -hmm. long. It has been life-changing. I went on a all women's climbing, rock climbing, camping, primitive camping retreat. And when I was there, I was like, I couldn't have been here mm. nine months ago. I couldn't yeah. have done this. This wouldn't have been possible because of how I was in life. And it's been, we don't have to plan our, we can just go out hiking on the weekend without me being like, well, I can't because I'm going to be in too much pain, you know? And so it's just been, uh, it's been life-changing. It really has being able to get all of that done and diagnosed and, but then you feel better. Right. And you're like, okay, well, maybe it wasn't diet. It was just <laughs> yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. And so you start to slack off a little bit, you know? And so now I, but now I can tell in my body, I'm like, I've been slacking off this week and I've been eating things that aren't good. Like I love macaroni and cheese. It's like my favorite food ever. But if I eat full on dairy filled gluten, macaroni and cheese, I'm paying for it for like mm -hmm. four days. <laughs> now being able to focus on slowly, instead of just trying to overnight jump in the pool of plant-based, change our whole life. I'm slowly implementing and finding what works. Next we have Katie. Katie and I have known each other for many, many years. She was a former client of mine several years ago, and she now works for Plant Center Nutrition, and I'm so, so grateful for her. Katie discusses how she had to change her relationship with herself before she could change her relationship with food. Here's Katie. So one day I just woke up and I was just, like they say, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I was like, I can't do this by myself. I think that was kind of like an eye-opening moment. I had a lot of these moments on Sunday where I would be like, okay, Monday I'm starting, right? Yeah, yeah. And then something would happen and it'd be like nine o'clock. Oh, I don't feel like going to the grocery store and getting ready, you know? And then I'd have a stressful day on Monday. Okay, I'll start next Monday. And then you go through this like shame spiral. Why couldn't you just do what you said you were gonna do? And then you eat more. And then it's this just this vicious cycle, you know? One day I, I literally remember the day I just woke up and I was like, I can't do this by myself. And I am so tired of living the way that I'm living. I feel horrible. I have no life because I just wanna hide at home. 
and it's not a life. I'm not mm. living. I, I'm going to work and I'm coming home and I'm cranky and I'm embarrassed about what I look like and how I've let myself get to this point. And I finally just decided that I needed to get help. And someone, someone beautiful and wonderful came into my life. <laughs> I wonder who that could be. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't remember if I called you or if I sent you an email, but I knew the first time that, that we talked that it was going to be, we were going to make a great team. And I knew that this was the first step to change my life for mm -hmm. sure. Well, and I know a large part of your story because a lot of what you're talking about is sort of these like external motivators of losing weight, you know, wanting to look better. But I know that you have done a lot of inner work you know, in the past few years, especially, and, 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 uh, while we were working together as well. So I'm curious because I know a lot of people can relate to this as they look at maybe going plant-based or, um, the food that they're eating kind of more from an external factor of like, I, or a kind of a single mind is like, I just, I just want to lose weight. Tell me more about kind of what shifted internally for you and what sort of changes that you notice, maybe approaching it from a different perspective. Absolutely. And I was just, I literally called you because I thought you were going to, I thought I was, you were going to do all the work for me and you were going to tell me exactly what to eat and I wouldn't have to think about anything and it was going to be easy peasy and that was it. And I think the first four phone calls, I was just crying the whole time <laughs> um, because we didn't actually, we did talk about food and what was going to change in that respect, but a lot of what we talked about was and you were able to pull this out of me was I had a long history of self-esteem issues. I've been doing a lot of work kind of like where that stems from. And I think as women, I've been doing a lot of uh, kind of internal work on kind of how we're socialized. And I was a firstborn. I think you learn to be a people pleaser. You learn to be quiet and polite and maybe not trust yourself, maybe not think that, you know, your voice is as important as the boys' voices in the classroom. I've always had issues with, you know, self-worth and self-esteem, and I didn't really have a weight issue. I look back when I was in high school and I thought I had a weight issue. I looked at myself in the mirror and hated what I saw. Looking back at pictures, I was beautiful and I wish I had appreciated it at the time. You live, you live and you learn. So the majority of the work that we did and that I've been doing because it's a continual process is to really change how I feel about myself. And I think for my journey, that was the most important piece of the puzzle because I was using food as a way to self-soothe that self-loathing at the end of the day, at the end of a hard, stressful day that we all go through. And then also as kind of a self-destructive behavior where you go and you order fast food or you eat a whole pizza or a whole thing of ice cream just to, because you're, you don't think that you're worth taking the time for to be healthy for because everybody comes before you. I've also been in customer service since I was about 16. So I'm kind of conditioned in the workplace to put everybody and serve everybody uh, before me. So those two combinations of just kind of socialization and conditioning with that low self-esteem, I really had to learn how to love myself again and fall in love with myself again, um, which was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. We talked a lot about inner dialogue, like your inner self, like how you speak to yourself. I think I remember us working together one time and you asking me to say out loud what I was thinking inside. Mm -hmm. And it was so disgusting and ugly. Like I didn't even want to say it with my words to another person. Uh, and that's how I was speaking to myself multiple times a day, every day for the last 20 years, you know? Yeah. And so that was a really hard habit to break. But once that started to change where I really started to forgive myself for a lot of things and really realize that I don't have to be perfect at everything. 
yeah. um, was a major turning point. So I think I was also kind of cursed with this. And I think a lot of us women are, is the need to be perfect. And I think in uh, the social media age where comparison is something that we're all having to deal with on a minute to minute basis is really challenging as a woman. The expectations to be the best coworker and the best friend and the best hostess and the best wife and the best sister and the best mother. I don't have that um, issue, but I know a lot of my friends do. It's just a lot of pressure. And I was kind of stuck in this vicious cycle where if I wasn't perfect at something, then I would quit. It was, it was a real turning point when I kind of faced myself in the mirror and working with you discovered that perfection is an illusion. It's, you know, no one is perfect. So it's a race that you're always going to fail. You're literally setting yourself up for failure if perfection is your goal. It really was about learning to love myself, forgiving myself, and changing that inner dialogue has really reshaped my entire life. And that part of my journey was the most important piece. I had to be able to conquer that in order to function in the other parts of my life, in order to actually live my life. So I can't thank you enough for helping me get to this point. I'm still a work in progress. We all are. We all are. Absolutely. So it sounds like a lot of that inner work that you did on your relationship with yourself and your journey really had a large impact eventually on your relationship with food and eating and kind of your perspective and outlook there. Absolutely. So I had a really difficult relationship with food that probably started around college where I started to use it to kind of cope with stress. And as teenagers, as you know, in America, that's not a focus. We're not taught how to deal with stressful situations and conflict and things like that. And so I, you know, some people use all different forms of ways to cope and I just chose food. And so it started and then eventually became a habit. And then those habits are hard to get rid of. Started in college and eventually became uh, one of those bad habits that was hard to break. When I'm thinking about food now, I'm really looking at it as a way to fuel my body, a way to nourish my body. I am going to be 40 this year. (laughs) So we started, we started to work together uh, about two years ago. So that 40 number was coming around the corner and now it is knocking. Now that I have that self-worth, I want to be a around long. I have lots of goals that I want to achieve. I have lots of things that I want to do and things I want to see and experience. And when you don't love yourself, you don't want to do any of that. You you just want to hide. And the fact that I can use food now, that relationship is much more healthier. And I have so much healthier habits to take with me through the world. I'm excited about those things to come. I'm not worried about 40. I feel fantastic when I wake up in the morning. I don't have to worry about, am I going to have a stomach ache today? I have no energy. I just want to go back to bed. And that's not every day. I have good and bad days, just like everyone else. The relationship with food and how it allows me the privilege to kind of walk through this life being excited instead of sluggish and irritable, (laughs) you know, it's just a whole different life. When I look back on my life a few years ago, it's, it's hard to imagine. And no wonder it was hard to get up in the morning because you don't feel good. Right. And so this plant-based lifestyle, it works for me and it's changed my life completely for the better, for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Vanessa was a former client of mine, and what we discuss is how she's been navigating restaurants and going out as a new vegan, like how she goes about doing that, because eating out is very, very important to her. So we talk about that in this clip. Here's Vanessa. I know you enjoy going out to eat, and that was something that I remember talking about with you in the beginning. It's like, well, how am I going to do this? This is something that I really enjoy. You know, it's it's fun Mm -hmm. to do. You you have a lot of restaurants near you. So- 
I do want to kind of unpack like the struggles that maybe you faced and how you sort of worked through them and how you're still sort of allowing yourself maybe that flexibility, um, trying to avoid maybe that all or nothing. Like it has to be either 100%, you know, vegan or I've failed. Um, so kind of walk us through that. So eating out is important to me because I like being sociable. I'm, I talk to pretty much everybody. So I love going out to eat. And a lot of my friends are in the hotel and restaurant field. So they manage a lot of restaurants. So I like to go and support them. So a lot of my friends work in Italian restaurants. And that's, as far as I have found so far, it's actually one of the hardest in Italian restaurants. because Everything has cheese in it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that's where I had to be like, all right, Vanessa, you don't want to make this journey unenjoyable and feel like it's a chore because then that's when it gets to be hard so I'm gonna find what I want and do as close as I can to eating the way that I want to eat whether that's ordering vegetarian or ordering vegan I'm like I'm gonna do the best that I possibly can mm. but doing that I, it was more enjoyable to eat out because I didn't have it, it's a lot more easier to find a place that has vegetarian that can be transferred into vegan versus strictly just vegan so it was really cool. And I actually went out with one of my colleagues to a restaurant near my house and it's a family owned restaurant. He was going there to teach me something about the restaurant industry for a food truck that I wanted to start. And he actually told them ahead of time that I'm vegan. So they actually prepped a whole meal for me that was vegan. Oh my gosh. It was awesome. And that actually made me, made, made me feel so welcome too. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's just really looking ahead of time at the menu, picking out what you think can be altered and maybe even calling ahead like my colleague did. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I think all of those things are so helpful for people who are wanting to transition or are transitioning or even are plant-based. It's like, like you said, you're doing the best that you can. And what's been really helpful for you is either looking ahead at the menu, maybe calling mm -hmm. ahead, or even just, again, like if, if you can't order something that's vegan, then go vegetarian. And again, it's all, it's, it's trying to avoid that all or nothing mentality where you feel like it is either 100% plant-based, 100% vegan, or you failed. And I feel like Vanessa, you do such a beautiful job of that, of like allowing yourself that flexibility. So like you said, it's this lifestyle, obviously there's a pull for some reason to be vegan, to be plant-based, but yeah. you're also navigating in a way where, like you said, it's not a burden and it's, it's really fun and enjoyable. And you're still able to go out and yeah. enjoy your friends. Holly McKinnon, who is also the owner of Small Seed Bar, we talk about how to deal with medical providers and or family when telling them that you're planning a vegan pregnancy. Here's Holly. I'm curious kind of what the conversation was maybe like with your doctor, if there was any like hangups or like challenging you on maybe, you know, you should be possibly doing something else or even from like friends or family, um, what kind of like maybe pressures or maybe misconceptions that they had. Yeah. So it was actually funny. Like, like I said, when I found out I was pregnant, I was in California. So I had a doctor in California. And then when we first moved to North Carolina, we lived in Winston-Salem. So I had a doctor in Winston-Salem and then I moved to Raleigh. I had a doctor in Raleigh. The doctor in Raleigh is the same doctor I have for Sage for my second pregnancy. But between all those doctors, like nobody ever had an issue. They were just like, we'll feel more comfortable taking like your blood just to make sure everything is like stable and safe. And like you and baby are both getting the nutrients you need. Like you're not iron deficient and things like that. But I think probably because I had a good track record on my first one, they didn't have to do it with this one. Not doctors, but family, like, you know, family feels like they can like say anything to you, I feel like. <laughs> yep. And like, they're not, I know that they're never coming from like a rude or mean or like place like that. But sometimes you're just like, did I ask for your opinion? <laughs> like, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I had a lot of family who, not like my immediate family, but like cousins and aunts and friends and stuff like that and even just people like out in public like right being like well don't you need like you're saying like well what do you do for calcium or what do you do for iron don't you need to eat me oh or like oh I've heard that that can have that that can like lead to issues with the baby is your baby going to be malnourished maybe your baby's going to be born only five pounds and I'm like my baby's like growing healthy like everything's good and it's kind of like what you were saying with like supplements literally nothing really changed like through my pregnancy, what I ate was the exact same. I just ate more. The supplements I took, I just took more. <laughs> I think sometimes people want to like overcomplicate this idea of like, I'm vegan and I want to get pregnant or I'm vegan and 
I am pregnant. So I need to do all of these things. And it's like, if you already live a healthy lifestyle, like you've been leading this healthy lifestyle, there's really nothing else you have to do. Like one of my best friends is vegan, but she also just had a baby a couple months ago. And she was like insanely craving meat this time, like weirdly craving chicken and like steak. I think she fought it for a long time, but she was like, there's maybe there's a reason like my body's craving this. Right. And I'm like, trying to tell them like, it's probably like you're craving an actual like nutrient that's in that meat, right? Like maybe like you're iron deficient or something, but yeah. to each their own. Sure. And, and she did like, she ate it while she was pregnant. And then she now like she's, she had the baby and she's not eating it anymore. You don't need to tie yourself to like this thing of like, I'm vegan and I need to do it. And like, it needs to be perfect because it doesn't yeah. need to be perfect. We each have to just do what's best for for us and like what we believe is best for the baby and do not let your family or friends or doctors tell you can't do it because you can 100% do it. It is completely safe and healthy. The baby's going to be safe and healthy. My sister just went through an entire vegan pregnancy as well. Baby's perfect and healthy. And there's a couple things there. So even the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics says that like plant-based diets, vegan diets, vegetarian diets are okay for every life cycle. So pregnancy through like being an older adult, like they're totally safe. It's doable. Like there's no harm. And with that too, I like what you said, Holly, about like, I think a lot of times we have, we just end up overcomplicating everything. It's like, oh, well now I'm pregnant. So now I need to like do all these other things. You're like, yeah, there might be a few modifications that you have to make, but there's no need to like crazily overcomplicate everything so that it is overwhelming. and almost seems like it's not even doable because of that. If you have a doctor who's not supportive of you as well, I think that that's a reminder that these doctors work for us. We don't work for them. There's no reason we need to stay with a doctor who doesn't support the decisions that we make or what we choose to do as long as we're healthy. And like their only job is to make sure I'm healthy and the baby is healthy. Mm. Outside of that, like they don't really get to judge what I choose to do. If I choose to have a vegan pregnancy, if you don't believe in that doctor, that's fine. But like, this is my choice. People do get like pressured because you, you know, you want to trust your doctor, like your doctor is a professional. So you're like, okay, if he says I have to do it, I have to do it, but you don't like these doctors work for us. We can switch our doctor at any time if they do not support our decision. Yep. And I think that's a great point, whether you're wanting to become pregnant or are pregnant or just in general, like, like you said, these doctors work for us. And if they don't support your lifestyle of like being vegan or wanting to go plant-based or whatever it is, then maybe it's time to find another doctor that does support you. Like that's really important. And honestly, Holly, it's refreshing to hear that you had three doctors while you were pregnant with your first child and that all of them, it sounds like it really did support you and didn't like really overly question you or try to push you in in another direction. Yeah, it was actually like super super. I I mean, in California, I was like, you know, they're a little bit more open to this like lifestyle, right? But then even when I moved here, like I love Winston-Salem, but Winston-Salem's like a much smaller, like Raleigh-Durham. Yeah, you would expect it here too, probably. But like Winston is like a much smaller place where you would think maybe those doctors might be like a little bit more closed-minded or like old-minded type of like teachings, but they were totally cool there too. So I think it's just important to find like the right doctor who supports your decisions. I really do appreciate you saying too, like that this is like your journey, your pregnancy, and and you need to obviously advocate for yourself and do what you feel like is best for yourself and your baby. Exactly. Steven, who was a former client of mine as well, discusses all of the great things that have happened to him as the result of going plant-based. Steven has a remarkable story. Here's what he has to say. So take us back to February, 2021. You're in the doctor's office. He's telling you, Steven, you have diabetes. We got to put you on medication and fast forward to going back to see him. Cause we, I know you saw him a couple of times as we were working together. What ended up happening? So yeah, here's where I get into numbers and hopefully people won't gloss over, but I think they're interesting. Yeah. So I had a full set of labs done in October, 2020. This was three, four months before I started on this journey. Um, And then February comes along. And so my AC1, which is the diabetic marker in February was 6.8, clearly into a diabetic phase. My cholesterol in October of 2020 was, my good cholesterol was at 50. My triglycerides were, were 138, my glucose was 188, and my PSA, which is a strong indicator for prostate cancer screening, which is always tied into your diet, was 4.0. So 
Fast forward to October 2021, so a year later in um, seven months, eight months after I started this process, my AC1 went from uh, 6.8 in February to 5.1 in October, a decrease of 25%. And good cholesterol went from 50 to 64, it increased 28%. My triglycerides went from 138 down to 77, a decrease of 44%. My glucose went from 188 down to 103, a decrease of 45%. And this one is maybe the most remarkable one of all. My prostate cancer screening was cut fully in half from four to two. And those are the numbers. I mean, I'm a numbers guy. so. It's working. My weight went from 227 down to 177 in uh, about four months. From February through July, I lost 50 pounds and all of the things got better. So I don't have diabetes anymore. My cholesterol medication, I don't take anymore. I've done away with it entirely. My blood pressure meds have been cut basically in half. I don't have either GERD or invisible GERD, which is invisible GERD makes you cough all the time. It's kind of like, a, it's a horrible thing. I don't chafe when I walk anymore or have skin reddening. I don't fall asleep randomly. I have more strength, more energy. I think I look better as far as body type. I have more positive emotions. I have a lot less anger. My clothes mm -hmm. fit me a lot better. I used to have pain sitting down wearing jeans with a belt because the belt was constantly pushing into my stomach and I don't have that anymore. I get to be more interactive playing with my grandbabies. I can get down on the floor. I can bend over. I can pick them up. I can roll around. I don't get out of breath. I can literally uh, scrunch down like a catcher in baseball for 15 minutes and not feel like my body's going to fall apart. I have much less swelling and inflammation in all my joints and muscles. I have way better self-control over all my impulse actions. And then probably the best thing is that I have a potentially longer life. So I get to enjoy all the people that I love in my life even longer than I might have before. And that's the real, that is the trophy at the end of all of this. Yeah. Yep. There's nothing. Rather there. long list and I'm building on it every day. I call it my reminder board. I actually hang this list that I've just read off of, I hang it from my mirror so that I look at it every morning. Things that have gotten better after changing my life. And yeah. these, I look at these things every day to remind myself that I will never go back to what I was uh, mm -hmm. because I don't lose all this. It's just so many good things. I mean, if I told you six months from now, all of these things could get better in your life. And all you have to do is blank. Why would somebody not do that you know yeah. this is like this gives this gives me a whole new reason to live you know a whole new reason to move forward in life so yeah you know, why wouldn't you know I, I guess from my perspective and maybe this is really just too simplistic if I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom you know why not take them and open that door yeah you know that's the way that I look at it mm -hmm. Yeah. And you did that. I mean, it took you feeling really poorly. Your doctor telling you, Hey, you're, you're knocking on basically getting insulin here soon. And it took you, your, your daughter eventually saying like, Hey dad, what's wrong for her to talk to her siblings to almost stage, you know, this sort of like quote intervention for you of like, Hey dad, we, we see, like you said, your, your demise and we want to do something about it because we want you around longer we want you to enjoy our kids your grandkids longer you know this is this is something that is possible and it's something that you can do you just have to really put your mind to it and you got to be ready for it yeah you can't do this unless you're prepared for it and it's it's not like you can do it for other people i guess that was the other lesson that i learned out of all of this and i say this to people they look at me really strangely. I said, this is the one time in your life when you have to be totally selfish. Mm. And for me, that was a strange concept because I only cared for other people. I almost never cared for myself. If I had $100 in my pocket, I would give 
you know, 98 of it away and keep to just in case something happened. <laughs> it's just the way that I am. I, you know, I never really cared about myself that much. Um, it was always about my family. It was always about my kids. It was always about my community. This was literally the first time that I can remember just doing something for myself, with myself, entirely for myself and selfishly doing anything that I needed to do, regardless of what other people felt about it. You really put your head down and you focused on you for a yeah. long time. When, like yep. you said, so much of your life had been focusing on other people and really paying, not, not paying attention to yourself and your health until it came to this point where you had to. I met Laura on social media. She is a social media manager and she is incredible. Laura discusses the importance of having a supportive community around you. She had zero friends or family who were vegan or plant-based and found an online community that works just as well. Here's what Laura has to say. When you surround yourself with other people who are doing something similar and are passionate about it as well, like Veganuary, which can be a really fun experience, yeah. especially if you're hesitant and new, and maybe you want to be part of a really large group or really large movement of people that are doing it, it can be a really great option for you. Yeah, it, it was really fun. And it was, and it was really lovely to just people were posting their like meals of that day. And obviously I don't suggest that everybody shares all of their meals of the day because I don't think that's necessary like that can be counterproductive but it was just nice for inspiration it was just nice to see people getting on board and just seeing yeah it just gave you inspiration yourself during the month if you were feeling like oh actually I'm not quite sure today and then you saw what somebody else had and you're like oh yeah that's a really nice idea so because especially I don't have that in real life so if you are somebody who would really like to try it but you know that there's a lot of people around you who are not interested in it then you definitely need that sort of online community uh, to help help you the other massive thing about being in the group is like managing conversations so inspiration is great and like kind of ongoing kind of motivation without kind of like forced motivation just kind of the reminder each day from like what people are sharing and talking about in the group but actually oh like having just help with how do you respond to people so I still get nearly every day like little tiny remarks from my dad and from my mum um Adam is great he doesn't really actually he never really has um you know my brother and just ah, oh, and you're you just want to just mm. <laughs> And it, yeah, it's really hard. Like, I don't care. No, I'm, I'm literally like, just don't start. Just don't start with me. But um, when you first start, it's hard to have the confidence to be able to say, actually, I don't agree with you. Or, actually, I don't think that's quite right. Or for me, or it's not something that I'm, I really want to do or support. And But yeah, to be able to actually say that to somebody who, like a loved one, it's really hard because it's just, yeah, that, that conflict isn't like, nice and and often somebody could ask and then they might have you know the, you know they have those little like little snide remarks about you know being plant-based or vegan and and just having other people in that you can ask and like hear what they've said or kind of what responses what can you say that's so important as well because yeah like I said I had no not a single person in my life was vegan or plant-based when I started it was yeah. scary it was, it, but it's amazing definitely try it but definitely have your own supportive group and it'll be great yeah I know a lot of people listening can relate to that because most of them are the only ones transitioning and none of their friends or their yeah. family members are doing it so it can be really challenging overwhelming and like you said just being able to bounce ideas off of one another or knowing how to just knowing how to respond to people when they do make comments can yeah. be really helpful yeah Greta, who is a former client of mine, she talks about her transition to plant-based eating and how she thought of going vegan or going plant-based as more of an adventure and really tried to have fun with the new changes. Here's what Greta has to say. I just remember thinking there are a lot of alternatives that I just never really thought about. Like, for example, yogurt, like they make you know, vegan yogurt. It's not a big deal. Also, did you know you can buy your own yogurt maker, which I recently have bought my own oh. and I haven't done it yet, but I hypothetically think it's pretty easy. You just order some of the, uh, I'm blanking on the, like the cultures, the cultures. Yeah. You order the cultures and you pick your milk and you put it in the machine and it does its thing. And so I'm really curious. It might taste really gross, but I'm like, <laughs> so, you know, it's, and it's, so, you know, in that kind of thing, it's become, like an adventure a little bit trying to figure out 
What do I want to find an alternative for? And nine times out of 10, it's not even that bad. Like for example, um, our go-to is applesauce when we're making cookies in place of eggs. And number one, that's healthier. Number two, we always have applesauce for the kids. Oh yeah. So it, it, it's really not a big, big deal. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you run into issues, you know, with the eggs have the binding properties. So like, for example, we made a key pie and it was like key lime soup. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it just gives you a laugh and, and, yeah. and you know, you have fun with it. You, you eventually get to the point where it's not a chore, but you just kind of have fun looking for like workarounds. Yep. Um, I mean, there's definitely frustrating moments and there's, you know, where like, for example, people at my new job were already talking about how they're excited about a pizza party because we like did the most trainings or whatever. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, there are plenty of now, you know, pizza places that uh, the options out there, but I'm like, we're definitely probably not going to be getting like a pizza just for me. Yeah, so right. I'll be like having my own thing that day. But like, you know, it's like anything you, you just get used to what you believe in and what you want to do. And it's, it's definitely hard. Um, you know, I, I, and even this is just recent. I mean, I've been vegan since 2017, if I remember right. And, um, I, I literally a few months ago cried, I cried Mm -hmm. and it felt good. I was like, you know what? I feel better after my cry because there was this burger that I really wanted. And it was like from my, I'm from originally from Northern Minnesota and they do these wild rice burgers. They're amazing. Like, I just love them. And I recently, I I realized I hadn't been to a restaurant in a few years to go get one. And I was like wanting to meet my friend at this, you know, burger place and whatever. And I, you know, called the restaurant to double check because I am a little OCD, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, they said, yeah, they have egg whites in them for a binder. And I'm like, okay. Like, but it, I just, I felt so mad in that moment. I was like, why you know my husband was like just have it it's your favorite thing and I'm like no I don't want it anymore now it's ruined it's tainted like I was Mm -hmm. like no but um you know it's moments like that where it's okay to be frustrated and it you know I honestly I felt better after I had a little cry and I was just like screaming in the car but then I also I figured out that they had a falafel burger. I was like, you know, combing through the menu, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize they had a falafel burger. And I was like, that's amazing too. So I had an amazing falafel burger that didn't have egg whites. Good. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's kind of just being ready for the tough moments. But you know, at the end of the day, I feel, I feel really good about where I'm at. You know, I feel, I feel like I'm living my best life. But I believe, you know, and you can't put a price on that. Yeah. Yeah. So. When you're living a life that's like aligning with you, what's important to yep. you. Yeah. yeah. I like mm-hmm. what you said earlier, Greta, about it. You almost kind of have to look at it as an adventure. Like it's everything is not going to be perfect. You're going to make this key lime soup at some point, yeah. you know, or an yeah. example, yeah. something similar. It's like, you just kind of have to just kind of go along with it not be too hard on yourself, have yeah. those laughs and kind of make fun of like, oh my gosh, I can't oh, believe I just made laugh. this. <laughs> yeah. And then also have those cries, which I think is also just as important because yeah. in a way you're sort of grieving some of these things that you really enjoy that don't align with you anymore. And I think, like you said, if you would have really wanted that burger, you would have had it, but because there were egg whites in it and you knew it, you, you were like, no, like, I, I actually don't want that, you know, as delicious as I know it is like, mm-hmm. I'm going to make that decision and own it that I'm actually not going to have it. Rachel was a client of mine for nearly three years. Rachel and I discuss how her why has shifted over the years and what advice she would give to her younger self. Here's Rachel. One thing that you've told me before is that your why has really shifted over the past couple of years too, which it sounds like that's part of what is helping you again, kind of stand your ground or believe that this is the lifestyle for you is your why has really shifted. Yes. And I believe a lot of that has to do with my constant listening to doctors and reading books and like looking at proof over and over and over again. This for me, like I've been on diets my whole life Mm. and 
nothing has worked, but this to me is a lifestyle. But I also, you know, I, I tell myself and I tell people, I became vegan for health or plant-based for health reasons. But now that I have been into this world, I can see enough of other areas where this benefits, including environmental aspects, animal welfare. And that is things like once you see it and once you know it, you can't go back. And so this is something that keeps me very, very grounded. And I, I feel like I know where I stand and I feel very, very firmly about it. I feel like a well-planned plant-based diet is very, very beneficial at all stages of life. It has been proven in scientific data and journals. I, I, I just love speaking about it and I love telling people and I love the conversation. So I invite anyone if they have that conversation to reach out, if they want to know more to reach out. Um, I'm not an expert, but I do know where I can guide them, you being one. So <laughs> it's just one situation where this is one of my biggest, biggest passions in life. And isn't it obvious to those of you who are listening that she is incredibly passionate about this. And, and of course I can see her on video right now and she's just lighting up talking about this. And I'm just like raising my hands, you know, like keep going. (laughs) So it's beautiful. Rachel, I'm curious. So we'll have you say where people can connect with you at the end of this, but if someone's listening and they're really resonating with what you're saying, what would you say if you could go back just a couple of years and give yourself a piece of advice or give someone advice who is listening and is resonating with what you're saying or is in a similar situation, what would you say? First of all, it's not an overnight thing. And I have steps that I think if I go back that I would um, give myself advice. And the first one is allow yourself to eat because I've been on so many diets and like restricted myself so much. I have really hurt myself in the long run And not only that, but one of my favorite things to learn about is the gut microbiome. And when you restrict these foods, you know, your body is going to react a different way. And I now talk to my body as if it's a person. And I say, well, my body now doesn't trust me when I, when I'm going to, it doesn't know when I, when I will eat. And I really try to think of it as you know, someone who is looking for trust in me. And so I have to provide that for my body and give it food continuously because I would skip meal in the past and, you know, really just allow myself to not think of food as the enemy, but as something of fuel for me to keep going, kind of like a car. That would be the first one. And I think that's the biggest one for me, because as you know, throughout our whole time together, that's been one of my biggest challenges. If you really think about it, it's really profound. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. If, if people yeah. are like me, because this is not an overnight thing, this might be really hard concept to kind of grasp. I would say, you know, we did some journaling. You kind of helped guide me through some journaling in the past. And also, you know, ask for support from friends or family if you can, but even if you can't or or people can't grasp this concept, I would really encourage some journaling, some writing down, some gratitudes about why you're grateful. You know, for someone like me who has gone through some really low lows, I'm very grateful when I can go outside and play with my kids or go and walk my dog. Those are some things that I think about, and I'm just really grateful because even though they're so insignificant and we take it for granted every day, I am really grateful because there were times where I couldn't manage not even a walk. That is something that I really, really think about. And I'm just really grateful. And I just tell my body, I'm like, thank you so much for allowing me to be this and for walking with me all day. And like, like I said, I treat it now, like it's someone who deserves trust and attention and care just like I would someone else. Find activities or things that you love to do. If you love to throw on loud music and dance, do that. Find ways to be happy and manage stress. And so I would say find those things that make you happy, make you smile, make you laugh, and really try to bring that together for just the sole purpose of of being happy. 
be and not thinking too much about it. I'm really a big advocate for wellness because of everything I've been through. Just find foods that, you know, nourish you and feed you because you deserve wellness. And I think of my body like, okay, this is going to help fuel me through the day. This is going to drive me forward to the next activity. And you wouldn't drive a car without gas. So it's kind of the same concept with your body. Just make sure that you're eating some things that make you feel good. Another thing that I would say is know that you are uniquely you and you are enough because that is something that I was never told when I was younger and I've always had a hard time accepting. And so now that I look at myself in the mirror, I really tell myself the way I am is enough. The way I look is enough. The way I speak is enough. And just practice saying that to yourself because once you get in the habit of saying that multiple, multiple times, you're going to start believing it. And so that is a really important part of it, even though it seems a little bit silly and hard to grasp because I know a lot of things that made me insecure was just thinking that I just wasn't worthy. And now doing all these combined really have made a difference for me in my life. And like I said, this is not an overnight thing. This is this might be really hard to grasp. This might be something that would make you upset like it did me in the beginning. I didn't grasp this concept initially. So I would say just give it time. Definitely find ways to let these things out and just trust the process is what mm, I would say. Yeah, I love that. Trusting the process. And too, I, I appreciate you being transparent that this is not an overnight thing. Like it wasn't just a switch that you flipped for yourself with your mind. This is something that's taken a lot of work, a lot of time, energy, effort, and it by no means hasn't been this like smooth sailing path that you've been on. Like there's been a lot Absolutely. of ups and downs. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not perfect with everything. I still go through my roller coaster days, but for the most part, I really try to think of the, all these things and, and just find gratitude in moments, find happiness in moments and going through those practices that I just mentioned. Yeah. And just to summarize what you said, I love that you started with giving yourself that time to trust your body, giving yourself like allowing yourself to eat, which can be a really hard concept to grasp. Like you said, if we've been on diets, you know, for most of our life. So sort of giving yourself permission to eat, trusting that your body is going to tell you when she's hungry, when she's full and responding to that. And like you said, it's it, by no means, is it perfect? And we're still not perfect and we're never going to be, but it's something right. that you can definitely start to practice now if that's something that you want to do. And two, I think it's great that you brought in, you know, it was a couple steps later, but just taking that time to recognize what foods make you feel good. So like you said, you know, like it kind of took you a while to realize like eating a bunch of cupcakes at once, like it might've tasted really good in the moment, but when you really took the time to think about it, it almost made the situation worse because physically you didn't feel well. And then you would sort of like re-enter this guilt shame spiral with what you were doing. So now your relationship with food looks a lot different. If you want a freaking delicious vegan cupcake, you're going to have one and you're going to enjoy it, Yes. <laughs> but this isn't something that you're maybe doing in secret or eating a bunch at once. No. Yeah. And right. then with all that, Rachel, it's beautiful. Just saying that you are enough. Like this is something that I know that you, like you said, didn't hear a whole lot as a child. And it's something that you found along with the gratitudes piece that you had touched on earlier is really helpful. Like focusing on the gratitude piece. Like you said, like there were days when you couldn't even get out of bed and now like going for a walk, you're like, wow, like my body's able to do this. I'm able to do this. And it's something so simple, but when you can look at it through the lens of gratitude and gratefulness, like I'm actually able to do this, that can really start shifting your mindset. So that in conjunction with telling yourself, I am worthy, I am enough over and over and over again can be really powerful. Until next time, keep thriving.